Morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to the INCOSI team for um, inviting me. Um, delighted to be back in Edinburgh. It's the city of my birth, so uh, any good reason to come here, I'm, I'm back in the city. Um, my name is Julie Alexander, Director of Urban Development at Siemens, and I work in the Siemens Centre of Competence for Cities, based in this building here. This is the Crystal Building. It was built in 2012 by Siemens as a showcase to urban sustainability. And it's this pretty cool building. It's the only one in the world, as far as we know, that has both of the top design certifications in the world for sustainable design. Um, and although our offices are there, and we're about a team of 30, um, it's also a conferencing facility for organizations that are like-minded around cities and sustainability. Um, but half of the building, this half here uh, on, on this side, is also a public exhibition to urban sustainability. It's, um, if you are in London, it's very close to city airport, so do come and pay us a visit. It's a pretty uh, interesting place. So why cities and uh, what are Siemens doing in the city space and what's all about today? Well, um, our portfolio, for those that don't know, uh, spans a number of infrastructure areas. So mobility, anything from high-speed rail, rolling stocks, signaling, um, right through to uh, highways management, traffic management, congestion management. Uh, then there's energy, everything from uh, generation, transmission, distribution, right through to things like smart grid, virtual power plants, building controls. Uh, we have a healthcare division and also something we call digital factories. That was the old industry part of the business, process drives, gas turbines, um, and something that's really focused around factory automation and um, really interesting part of the business where we build digital twins for things like mass customization. And that's a topic for, for another day. But um, all of those infrastructure areas, as you might imagine, really... Um, are, are most prevalent, if you like, in our cities and our urban environments. And that's why, for us as a business, what happens in cities is, is really important. And the needs for infrastructure are changing, and the demands are changing, and that has an impact on our business. And so Siemens does a lot of research into what's happening out there. It's probably around eight years ago we identified how the megatrends were going to affect our business. And that's things like population growth, so increasing demand for services uh, and infrastructure, urbanization, more and more people moving into cities. And I'm sure you've heard these numbers so often, so I'm not going to repeat them. But the, the amount of people now in our cities, the amount of people we have to serve with our infrastructures is obviously increasing significantly. Demographic change, so we're all living longer, uh, so more people living longer. How do we accommodate this through the health services? And also climate change, and, and we all know about that, and that affects every, every element, really, of the infrastructure fields that we're involved in. But these are the new entrants for cities. If you're a city government, if you're a mayor, city hall, a local authority, these are the things that have been appearing over the last 10 years that you have to start thinking about. And that's on top of everything else, the job creation, the housing, the waste management, the policing, the street cleaning, all of those things that are business as usual for cities. And now all these new, almost unquantifiable demands that are heading their way. And if you add on top of that, their aspirations for economic growth you begin to wonder you know, how are cities coping. And if you put that all into a pot and mix it all up and think of the city as a system, you begin to realize there's quite a lot of complex problems that, that need resolving today. But then don't forget as well, there's also people in cities. So cities are always changing. They're unpredictable. We've got our habits and our behaviors and uh, worst of all, our expectations. Um, and this is cities, something cities need to manage and, and work with. So when we look at that, and um, even if you come up with a complex engineering solution to all of that, um, in, in real life, you know, from the city's perspective, who pays for all of that? Who, who pays for this new investment? So something that, that we look at as well is you know, how can cities think differently about how they procure these infrastructures? Has anyone here heard of the Barnett graph of doom? Can't really see. You know, um, so this is the London Borough of Barnet uh, a few years did a piece of research and it, what it looks at are the increasing, increasing needs for services and the local authorities' lack of ability to pay. 
And what it shows is that by 2030, Barnet will only be able to pay for adult social care and children's services. Now, if you ask any city, particularly in the UK, their biggest cost is adult social care. It's the big ticket item. And it's important because it's, it's really about how do you help people live today in their existing environments. It's not a problem that's going to happen. It's one that's already happened. So that's always where the greatest need will be. But um, what do you do if you're Liverpool? So Liverpool graph of doom shows that by next year, that's a year from now, they will only have enough money as a council to pay for adult social care. So these things are, are really quite um, pressing on councils. You know, how do they deliver their policing? How do they clean the streets? What's going to happen to all of these other services that, that we, we need and expect for the quality of life? So... Um, that's what we do at Centre Competence for Cities. We go and talk to, to cities about these challenges and how can infrastructure help them tackle some of these uh, problems and uh, what are the new technologies coming out today. And councils no longer want single point solutions. You, know, you have to be hitting multiple targets and multiple strategies now with infrastructure. So... Um, I don't have the answer. We don't have the answer to all of these problems. And I suppose nobody does because ch cities are constantly changing and evolving. Um, but what we can do is help them think about how to deliver this infrastructure more efficiently, more, affordabili more affordably, and also with resilience built into the system. So at Siemens, we're all about electrification, automation, digitalization. And it's that last area that I want to talk to you about today, the digitalization. So we're living in a digital world. We're digital consumers. You've seen everything uh, uh, that was introduced to you today about Twitter. We're communicating differently. And what I've been looking at for, for the last three years, few years really is how that's playing out in the city infrastructure space. Um, so it was about three and a half years ago um, this topic of smart cities came up and I thought, oh, for heaven's sake, just another jargon, um, you know, but no one's looking at it internally, so I should probably go and do that. It's a bit te technophobe at heart, so I wasn't really looking forward to it. But threw myself into it and uh, three or four months later I was a complete convert on the topic and uh, almost an evangelist, I would say, um, fully committed to this uh, topic. So, um, some slides now, so you don't have to keep looking at me. Um, so here we are, these are the mega trends that we talked about just a moment ago. And um, if you were just to take, for instance, demographic change, and you look at all the over 65s and the, the growing proportion, something like climate change affects them quite severely. So, um, with summer's getting warmer, winter's potentially getting colder in certain parts of the world, you get excess summer, uh, premature summer deaths, excess premature winter deaths. Um, with more and more people at pensionable age, how is the economy going to uh, cope with all of that? So these things are all so interrelated. But also one of the um, emerging issues that we're all unfortunately so very familiar with today is social and political stability, public safety and security. So this is something else that cities have to think about in amongst all these other challenges that they're facing. And so the digital transformation sits in amongst all of these trends. And you can see there really how connected devices, the growth of connected devices and, and how we're communicating today and the amount of data that we're using today really is having an impact on cities. So 2015, 204 million emails every minute, 4 million Google searches every minute. Um, and by 2020, 80% of the adult global population will own a smartphone. So already, um, you know, we, we have these new devices we carry around with us. How can cities use this as a way of connecting with their citizens? So this is... Um, the connected world. This is uh, how we're all digitally connected around the world. And um, in 2006, there were 2 billion connected devices. By 2020, that's expected to be 200 billion. Um, but what really interests me is today of the 7 billion people in the world, uh, 4 billion have a mobile phone, but only 3.5 use a toothbrush, which I find a little bit scary. Um, but it's said that around this year, around 5 million of us will be wearing remote healthcare devices. So already industries and sectors are beginning to think about how they can use this technology more effectively. 
So why is it important? Well, um, the government looked at this in the UK and they found that for every one pound invested in digital infrastructure, there's 20 pounds of economic value. So for cities, this is really important. MIT uh, suggests that data-driven decision-making makes organizations 5% more efficient. Now. And this is a little bit old now. I wonder if you asked them today if that figure would not already have gone up. And of course, savings to healthcare are also huge from the use of big data. So healthcare is, has about 80% of its data is unstructured. So that means when you go to a hospital, you go to several departments, most of them don't talk to one another. These files are held separately. You have no personalized uh, health plan. But that could, could change significantly in the years to come. For the UK, there um, is now a digital economy strategy. Um, encouraging digital innovation is seen as a huge growth area. In fact, in the UK, digital tech companies are growing 32% faster than any other sector in the economy. So huge opportunity there. And why is it important for business? Well, some of the figures that are out there at the moment, um, smart city market by 2020, around $1.5 trillion. Um, the infrastructure, global infrastructure market, McKinsey suggests is around $57 trillion in terms of the required need. And for Siemens, we expect a 15% growth in our activity around digitalization. That figure was revised. It was about 9% up until a year ago, and that was increased quite significantly, as you can see, in a short period of time. So what we're seeing, well, the cloud computing uh, is becoming more and more important for organizations and cities and how they do things. So you can see there, you know, how that trend is changing over time and how it's changing so quickly. So um, what really interests me is that 90% of organizations will have personal data on IT systems they don't own or control in a very short space of time. Um, no more IT departments. You know, this is becoming a business in and of itself. Then, of course, innovation in electricity systems is an area of interest for, for us at Siemens. Um, you can see there, again, what the waves of innovation have been. And now digitalization is also moving into energy. So we've gone through a process of increasing efficiency and optimization, but now we're looking at how digitalization really can improve some of that, give more choice, give more flexibility in the pricing markets. Um, so this is an area that we will see continue the expanding in the years to come. And then, of course, the evolution of big data. Now, cities are obsessed about data. They're becoming more and more obsessed. Um, data, any data, open data, give us your data. Um, we want more and more of it. Um, so what we're seeing now is data um, becoming something that's developing its own value. And um, just recently in Copenhagen, our friends from Denmark probably know this, they've opened a, a data exchange. So this is like a stock exchange for data. So companies can, if you like, upload their data onto this system and you can trade it. So um, I don't know if you're putting out for a tender and you need some data on street lighting in the city, you can go onto the system, does anyone have that data? And then you negotiate your market price. So this is the first of its kind, um, but there will be more of the same. And that's separate to the open data systems that, that many cities around the world have. This is about private sector working together and creating value around the data. So um, smart city sectors, this is what we see most of when we're talking to cities, the four areas that, that um, cities are most interested in, where they think they can get most optimization. You can see there some of the ways we're using the power of data and information to help optimize those systems. But where is it going for us as a business? Well, um, we're moving through this trajectory here, and you can see over on the left-hand side, um, most people already have these descriptive systems uh, in their infrastructure. So this is really looking at what happens, and capability and some analytics around there was a problem, what happened. Um, but then that's moved on over time to more of a diagnostic, why did it happen? So you can begin to understand the systems, but you can still see only 30% of these systems are, are adopted. Then um, what's becoming more common, I would say, is the predictive approach. So what will happen? So asset tagging, asset management, being prepared for um, maintenance requirements to reduce downtime on systems, this kind of thing. Um, but there's very few adopters. Where we're going now with, with most of this on our systems is around the prescriptive elements. So what shall we do about it? What's going to happen in the future? And what are we going to do about it? Um, 
But again, very few adopters at that stage. So it's, it's an interesting thing with cities because if, if, you, if you go and speak to them, they want innovation, but they don't want to be the first. They want a tried and tested system and um, they don't want anything to fail. They, they can't afford fail, failure. So um, trying to bring them this innovation um, is very difficult, particularly in infrastructure, knowing how long it takes to procure and implement. And then, um, of course, you'll also get cities saying, you want to innovate, but is this the right time to invest? Because technology is moving so quickly, and in five years, will it still be relevant? In 10 years, you know, have we future-proofed ourselves? So it's, it's quite um, a hard discussion to have with the cities around what this innovation can do for them and can they really um, invest in that, be comfortable with it. So for Siemens, um, again, there are the, the big mega trends and, and issues cities are dealing with, but when we talk to them, we have to talk in a different language. So you know, we don't go to cities and say, you know, do you want to buy a congestion charge system? Um, we go and we talk to them about air quality, um, about loss of productivity, time spent in traffic on the roads, because this is the language that they speak in. And that's what makes us a little bit different from the rest of the amaz amazing engineers that in Siemens and the great technology is we, we learn to speak to cities in a language they understand, and that's really imp important for them. So those areas in that little donut there are sort of the topics that um, I suppose are the headlines of discussion with, with cities today. Environmental care, again, beyond um, climate change, it's things like air quality um, and so on. So many new issues that cities are having to deal with. The new mayor of London, that's his number one environmental concern, air quality and how you tackle that in the city. So um, intelligent urban infrastructure, transportation, um, this, for me, is, is where we're seeing a lot of the great innovation because I think um, people, if, if transport systems don't work, you know, we know about it, we understand it, we know how that feels and the pain of that. Um, so we're seeing a lot of innovation in that sector, a lot of new small businesses coming into this play, uh, intermodal traffic management and, and e-car infrastructure with the digital connectivity. Then, of course, the smart energy. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, with those topics. Um, and building automation and uh, efficiency monitoring. Again, really important for cities who are looking at their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, which is a big push, particularly after COP21. So more and more cities now with a carbon neutral ambition by 2050. Um, so smart services, everything from city apps. So um, Why Plan there is, is uh, an app that in London that tells you what's going on, where you can find things. Um, Smart home, smart health, again, we talked about that. Remote healthcare devices, delivering health services to people in more remote locations, but from a service center within a city. How do you reduce those costs? How do you uh, prevent people having to travel into the city? So again, it's not just delivering the health, it's reducing congestion on the roads, um, creating better quality of life for people. Smart mobility, lots of apps coming out. I was just gonna ask actually, how many people know City Mapper? Any city mapper one at the back there? Which city are you from, sir? London. London. Okay, right. So that makes sense. So city mapper was, was born in London. And it was born the weekend that Transport for London released all their transport data. It's now in nearly 30 cities around the world. And it's uh, a genius little app. And... Um, it's a little bit, a little bit like sort of Google Maps, but much better. So it looks at public transportation. Um, if you're trying to get from A to B, it gives you all the different routes for getting there using public transportation, also walking, um, and biking if you have a bike facility in the city. And it also sets out the costs of doing all of that. So you can, you can look at all these different variables. It's very accurate um, and really useful. And, um, it's um, not here in Edinburgh, and I know that because the other night I was out and um, was w watching some tourists, and they didn't quite know where they were, where they were going. So I looked to see on City Mapper if, if it was um, here in Edinburgh, and it wasn't. And it said that you could vote for your next city to be included on City Mapper. So I went into that, had a little look, and instead of just typing in your city, they already had five options uh, for, for your voting, and Edinburgh was on there. So everyone, get out your phones right now, I don't mind, um, get onto the App Store, download City Mappers, little green logo with a white arrow in the middle, and uh, vote for Edinburgh, and let's get this city on the digital map. It's uh, 
it's such a, a great little uh, piece of kit. And actually, you know, it's, it's a huge success story, like so many other of these, these startups. They start with an idea, and so many are becoming unicorns, so these million-dollar businesses. Um, I don't know how many people use Skyscanner uh, if they're looking to travel. That's a, a, a small company that started here in Edinburgh. They've now got amazing offices just up at Lauriston Place, opposite uh, George Harriet's school. Again, another huge success story that started just with an idea. Um, so, mobile networks, digital city, connectivity, we all know about the challenges of getting full connectivity in cities, and it's at the top, not just of the city's mind, but also private developers. I'm working with a private developer in London who say if they could have one USP, it'd be to have the fastest broadband in Europe. You know, so this is really being pushed by the expectations of, of their customers. Smart watches, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that, um, and underground Wi-Fi now, so we can be connected anywhere, anytime. Environment, again, as I mentioned, things like air quality becoming hugely important. Um, water systems as well, how can we prevent leakage in water pipes? How can we track our water pipes under the ground? So many new digital systems coming out now to, to help cities do that more effectively. Um, safety and security, um, so there's some well understood systems there, um, controlled biometrics, so it's all changing around digital, but nevertheless, um, still with very similar outcomes. And um, Early warning systems as well, something that's happening of course with climate change is these extreme weather conditions, whether that's heat, um, but also things like flooding, and as we've all seen around the world how much more prevalent that's coming, we're getting a lot of activity now, flood warning, flood detection through digital mapping, um, and also fire detection as well, so these are areas that, that we're very involved in. So what's smart technology? Well, there's a list of things there, but it's really about combining the physical and the, the digital to collect data, use the data, apply the analytics to that data, um, and really get more from your system to increase the life of the system, reduce cost of operations, improve efficiency, all these things we talked about before. So when we're looking now at developing these technologies, again, we're looking across the sectors. So how can we hit as many of those different targets for a city as possible? Because they simply don't have the money to pay for all these individual systems anymore. So we've got to start bringing them together and look and see where the convergences are between the systems. How can we use regenerative, break, regenerative braking on trains to help decrease the amount of energy consumed in the, the rail network? So Transport for London is the biggest energy consumer in London because of all the systems that are, they're running. So reducing their bill by a, a, a very small amount will make quite a, a huge impact. <clears throat> so hierarchical versus vertical. So up until now, we've seen everything in silos. And everywhere we go in cities and organizations, everything in silos. So we have digitalization within a vertical. What where we're trying to get to know and what cities are interested in is digitalization across the vertical. So integrating these different sectors. Um, and developing systems. Uh, and so the battle is on at the moment for, for that open source system that allows you to integrate all your different infrastructures, get data, feed it through to the city mayor so he knows what's going on, so they can make better decisions and run their infrastructures more efficiently. So this is um, where we are on the journey around infrastructure. And um, you'll have heard of Industry 4.0, which is something in our uh, digital factory business that, that, that we are involved in very strongly. But this is infrastructure 4.0. This is the integration of horizontal and vertical systems all coming together with real-time information optimization so that we can better understand and optimize our city systems. So smart data to business. So how do we as a business um, make money out of this, where's the value? And you know, I speak to our, our business units whose job it is to um, develop the system, sell the systems, implement them, deliver them. And they've got to, to figure out where the value is for them in all of this. So what we have is multiple infrastructures all collecting huge amounts of data. And we have to apply our business intelligence to that. So it's our understanding of the, the, the domain and uh, the customer 
And then also our innovations. So last year, it seems there are 39 technical innovations every working day. And we've got to work out you know, which, one of those, which ones of those are we going to promote? Which are we going to um, carve out as a business? Which other innovations do we need to buy in and invest in as a business to ensure that we continue to be relevant and we generate new value? So how does that um, apply? Well, we see it quite extensively now in traffic management. So modeling the traffic flows in the city. That helps cities themselves to plan better, um, but also having sensors. So our cars are sensors. What we're looking at now is what we call vehicle to X infrastructure, where vehicles can talk to one another. Um, they can also talk to the traffic lights or the other infrastructure in the city in preparation for autonomous vehicles. Um, and the neural networks, so time series data. And this really helps to improve things like traffic flow, so we can manage the traffic lights better, so that the, the, the buses can be prioritized, emergency services can be prioritized, and we reduce congestion throughout the city. Gas turbines, we're, we're doing the same kind of thing, again, collecting as much data as we can to understand these systems better. So we're collecting data from 5,000 sensors per second. That's a huge amount of data now. And this is all going into systems so that we can, again, create the optimization not just of the turbine itself, but also reducing its emissions because this is something we have to think about alongside the operational components. Um, something as well we're doing at CERN. Um, so again, lots of systems there at CERN. Um, but this is really around trying to identify uh, early warnings in the system. So how can we look to see what's coming with the data? Are we being told anything unusual? Um, again, a, a terabyte of data a day just to understand and optimize that, that system there. And this then suggests we're going to need a whole lot of new skills and training in these engineering systems and cities as well to really begin to, to use that data effectively. So how are we applying it in, in, on the ground, as it were, in some of the other systems? Well, um, offshore wind is something uh, we're, we're very big in, and um, we have remote diagnostic centers uh, in Denmark for, for wind. So we're, we have 24 million parameters that we're measuring on the fleet, um, 300 million diagnostic calculations every week, um, huge amounts of data. But what does that mean? Why do we have it? Well, every turbine now over two megawatts has this because it's a no-brainer. And why is that? Because now we can deal with 85% of all alarms remotely. So we'll get an indication, maybe there's a vibration or something happening on the wind turbine. And we can look at that remotely and um, fix that problem. And over 99% of all those alarms are dealt with within an hour. Um, so if you're a customer, and uh, you have to be worried about health and safety. You have to worry about switching the turbines down so you can get people offshore to go and fix them. You can see instantly why this kind of diagnostic capability um, is something that is, is a must have in this kind of industry. Smart parking solutions, so again, more city-based urban solutions. Um, this, is, this is quite an interesting one, 30% of all the congestion in, in most of our cities is down to people looking for a parking space. Um, so that's not in congestion, it's air pollution, it's inconvenience, all these kinds of things. So we have a radar-based solution um, as well as sensors, which we apply, we integrate them into traffic lights, and, and into to buildings, into street lights, um, to detect availability of space, but not just the parking space. Um, also things like bus lanes, cycle lanes, hatch zones, um, electric vehicle charging points, dis disability parking. And what we do is um, collect this information, send it to drivers via a smartphone or in-car systems on the dashboard, and it alerts them to where the, the closest available space will be in the city. Um, again, reducing that congestion. But also what that does for the city is it helps them plan better. They can see where the highest demand is in the city. They can also, through the online payment system that you have, take the traffic wardens off the road, take the, the roadside um, 
payment systems off the roadside as well. So it's a huge amount of cost savings, better planning, and also better enforcement capability. So this is what it looks like. Information comes into the car. You've got a better understanding of what's happening on the streets. And the reason we did this is was because uh, enforcement in Berlin in 2006 was costing 255 euros per space. So it's really not a kind of cost that cities can sustain. So actually, this is a really very simple system for them. And what were the results? Well, um, you can see there, I won't go through them, but everything down to a reduction in payment avoidance. So this is extra revenues coming into the cities they weren't capturing before. So again, very simple systems, but tackling so many of the challenges that, that cities have today. So um, these fields, again, that, that we're working in and um, you know, all kinds of new technology coming out, with artificial intelligence, with um, things like um, mobile payment systems, um, autonomous driving, we're seeing as a, a bigger and bigger topic. So all of the automotive industry now is looking at autonomous driving, um, again, cleaner cars, this kind of thing. So all of these designed to really tackle some of, of the city's uh, biggest challenges. Um, so that's just some of the solutions. What I wanted just to, to run through um, now was the piece of work I'm currently looking at around this. So cities are very excited about digitalization, data, smart cities, and um, they know there's a big prize to be won. They don't quite know what that prize is exactly. Um, and they're working with private sector more and more so now to, to really understand what is the technology that's coming through, how can we use it to our best advantage, and how can we pay for it? And how can we bring in private investors to help pay for this kind of thing? Um, because at the moment, it's really just beyond their, their reach. We're seeing lots of pilot projects around the world or demonstrators typically publicly funded. But that's not a commercial model. It's not something that's going to scale up. It's not repeatable. There needs to be a process whereby you can identify revenue streams um, and return on investment for, for the private sector. So um, it's a very changing landscape and one that um, I'm trying to understand. And, and the reason I've embarked on this is, A, because as Siemens, we're involved in so many infrastructure sectors, it kind of makes sense for, for us to do this because the, the interest is where you get the convergence between the different systems. And also because no one else is doing it. And it's such an important thing. It's quite a difficult thing to, to get your head around when you think about what's the return on investment. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons I'm doing it, because you know, if you can crack this particular nut, then um, cities have got so much more power and capability at, at their hands to, to deliver some of these uh, projects. So um, digitalizing the city, the return on investment, the business case for doing this. So you speak to cities about smart cities, what they're thinking about, apart from the e-governance element of that is business growth, we talked about it. They want incubators, they want accelerators, they want to see new business evolving in their city. Um, that's largely around SME development. So um, also engagement tools. So they want to use this a little bit like Edinburgh Awards. Um, how do you communicate, not just with your citizens, but also visitors in the city? And how can we as a city understand um, what they're thinking and what they want? So you see this um, becoming more and more prevalent around the world as a way of communicating with citizens. Um, because ultimately, the mayor wants to keep them happy, right? Because he wants the vote to get in after his existing tenure. He wants to uh, continue his uh, position as city mayor. So keeping your citizens happy is really important. So visitor information platforms. Um, broadband connectivity, of course. This is something that they realize that they don't have it. Um, then delivering some of this stuff is going to be really difficult. And when we embarked on this piece of work, one of the first things we looked at, because IT systems are, are not a Siemens piece, they, they are within an infrastructure, um, but we don't lay fiber or provide communication networks. So first thing I really wanted to understand is, you know, who, who delivers these systems and what are their challenges and, uh, and so on. And then when you look at it, because I thought, well, when you have great connectivity in the city, then this is really going to help deliver some of these infrastructures. But actually, the banks have their own systems, the uh, academic institutions have their own systems, uh, healthcare has its own system, and they all want their own secure system because they all realize that um, if it doesn't work, 
it's really going to affect their particular area of business. So they can't rely on the local supplier to come and deliver fibre to the, to the um, home or fibre to the, the cabinet. They have to get on and do it themselves and make their own investments. So even at that basic level of infrastructure, this is quite challenging. And uh, there are not the savings to be made there that you, you might think. But Siemens sits over on the left-hand side, so we're looking very much at those big critical infrastructures. Again, many of the transport um, agencies have their own networks, their own secure energy systems, all these kind of things. So they're very much um, living and working and breathing in their silos because they're protecting what is so precious to them, what their uh, responsibilities are. Um, so the purpose of this study, as I say, really is to um, understand the return on invest investment. What we're going to do is understand those technologies. Where is it? If we were to digitalize the technologies and collect all the data, where do we get the optimization um, and the efficiencies from the system? Um, so we're going to look at all of that, the benefits of forecast data, um, and how that would also help municipal uh, departments better deliver their, uh, their operations. So we're going to um, model the technologies, uh, looking at uh, the integrated systems, looking at the efficiencies that, that come from all of that. Um, we're also going to model the financials involved in that, and then ideally demonstrate the business case for this. So I'm convinced there is one, just gotta find it. Um, so what we're doing, um, working with, actually these were the first six cities, though there are quite a few more now because the interest in this is just so huge. Um, so two cities in the UK, currently um, London and Aberdeen. Um, and Aberdeen actually is, is proving to be really interesting. So that was, uh, it's an oil and gas city. Um, but of course with the, the falling oil prices, it's really changed their economy. So they are, are second only to London in terms of their uh, GVA in, in the UK, but they have a transient community. So you'd struggle to get a flight to Paris from Aberdeen, but you get st one straight to Houston, Texas, one straight out to the Emirates. You know, it's a really sort of strange place to be. Um, so it's, uh, it's a city as well that didn't really make hay while the sun shone. You know, it didn't reinvest in itself while times were good. So it's now thinking about how it reinvents its economy. And it's really doing that around the, industry, the, the energy sector. So how can they take all the knowledge and expertise they have there and then bring that up to date, look at um, the hydrogen economy, look at the renewable sector, so they're investing in centres of excellence around that so they can retain their position in that sector. They have terrible congestion, they don't have a metro, they only have buses, and the buses are not that great, and I have to wait 20 minutes for a bus, so who wants to do that? Um, they're also building a new port, they have a port there now, they're building a new port, huge potential for economic growth around that, but also huge potential for increased congestion, increased air pollution, um, not a lot of fun for the citizens with all the HGVs that'll be moving around the, the port. So it's turning into a really interesting story. Um, what we do is we go and we spend a couple of days with the cities and really understand their story. This is not just about saying, okay, Aberdeen, have a metro. There you go, nice, shiny, new people mover. Um, that'll do quite nicely. No, it's really about going there, speaking to the people that run the transport system. What's your challenges? And it's no point in offering some amazing technology to model in this study when you meet the traffic guys and they go, yeah, but my traffic lights don't even work that well. You know, so it's really kind of bringing out the narrative. Where is the city going? What does it want to be in 20 years' time? Um, and challenging when you work with some cities that don't really know what they want to be, and you've got to kind of work through that story with them. Um, so it's such an important part of this particular piece of work, um, understanding their challenges. And what we've said to them is top, pick your top three infrastructure priorities from this list. Only li this list, because it's what we know and, and understand as, as a company. Um, and then we'll focus on those three things within your, your narrative as a city. So what we do, we look at the existing installed base in the city, what their story is, um, input all those infrastructure characteristics, and then um, build in the efficiency that come through digitalizing. So we take the installed base, if you digitalize that, how much further efficiency will you, will you get? And it doesn't get you to where you need to be. What other infrastructure ha do you have to implement to get you closer to that endpoint? So then we put in all the, the costs as well associated with those particular interventions. 
And just breaking that down a little bit further, so you have your three infrastructure choices over on the far left, breaking them down into the sub-packages, you know, which are the smart public transportation solutions that might work in this particular city in these circumstances, breaking that down, right down into all those different efficiencies, all those different costs, um, unit by unit, and then beginning to quantify what some of those benefits are. So what we're looking at is not just your typical return on investment model, we're looking at all the additional values to quantify. So that is um, the, the value to the, the private sector. If they were to bring their money, what's their additional value? In something like building technologies, you can begin to identify that because that brings um, reputational value to, to um, businesses that want to have classy uh, building asset stock. So there's, there's value to be had um, simply by reputation, simple things like that. Then we look at the um, value that arises to the city as a result of this particular um, implementation. And that could be anything like um, improving air quality, reducing congestion, um, such that you increase your productivity. Um, it could be reducing your carbon emissions. We quantify that, monetize that, add that into the equation. And the final uh, bubble of value that we're looking at is the value that comes from the data. And I mentioned earlier how people are beginning to look at um, data as an asset. Uh, and really trying to say to the city, well, if you've got all this data, what can you do with it? And how does that then help you improve other areas of your economy and your activities as a city business? Um, that's the one that's really hard to identify. Um, and quantify, and if you could do that, obviously you can monetize it, but the minute you try to um, define what that value is from the data, you're almost limiting it, because if everyone in this room had um, uh, a data set, they'd all do something different with it. So trying to second guess um, what, what uh, these SMEs, what genius they can bring to data is, is really quite difficult to predict. Um, so we model each infrastructure choice. We also then look at integrating this. So we model them all separately, put them back through the model, integrate all the efficiencies that are coming from those infrastructures. Um, so what do we expect to answer? Well, is there a business case uh, for smart cities? I hope so, because I spent quite a bit of time um, convincing my boss to um, invest in this particular study, so he's expecting a positive answer, but we'll have to see. Um, how does it vary between the selected cities and why? And this is not about benchmarking, because cities don't often like to be compared with one another, but it's saying, you know, in a, a more densely populated city, what works better, uh, et cetera. Are there quicker returns in different sectors? Every city wants a quick win. You know, as a mayor, you need to be seen to be delivering in the short term. So they want to know what's, what's going to work for us quite quickly. Uh, and so on. I'll not run through all of those uh, different things there. There's quite a lot of questions we're hoping to answer. And of course, we'll, we'll look at what that return on investment looks like. But what we're trying to assess, as I say, is not just your typical ROI model. It's actually beginning to quantify the benefits that come from um, a reduction in maintenance costs, a reduction in likelihood of failures, um, and improved resilience. Again, another huge topic for cities. And then we're going to look and see what are the benefits if we integrate all of these different systems together. So if you were to do all of these things, are there more benefits that arise to the city? And these graphs were just um, obviously indicative because we're only about halfway through the study, so I'm not quite sure where we are. But all of this really, really comes together um, in a way that, that cities are, you know, they're very passionate about this. And um, there's, there's not a lot out there. And as I say, it's very much sector by sector um, what, what you see out there. So um, again, not because I was inspired, but because somebody wanted uh, a book on smart cities. I spent the last year um, pulling together this book on Siemens thinking around smart cities. The first bit's all about what does the city have to do to think differently and prepare for this digital revolution. And the second half is, you know, where do we as a business act in this space, whether it's ports, healthcare, um, safety and security, and so on. So that was just launched last week, um, uh, kindly by um, the director for, assistant director for intelligence analysis at the Greater London Authority, um, who's a big supporter of this piece of work. <laughs>
So um, just to, to round this off and to move away from the slides, I've got a short video now, which um, you can see a longer version of it if you come to the crystal. So this is to whet your appetite. But um, this is really Siemens' perspective on how cities are going to change in the future. And it's 24 hours in the life of London, New York, and Copenhagen in 2050. Again, this is the abridged version. So um, come visit us at the crystal and, and see the longer one. a.m. Central Park, New York. Within the city, there are now two million more inhabitants than at the beginning of the millennium. As the population grows, the city adapts. The spaces around us are flexible, changing to match our needs. We simply pay to use a space or an item, then give it back, move it on, or recycle after use. Many people work from home, switching between business and leisure, the real and the virtual. Individuals are important, but community is king. 10.19am, Copenhagen. A surplus of energy has been generated, lowering prices. The smart grid responds, communicating with all producers and consumers. But the people in the city do not just consume electricity, they also generate and store it. The smart grid directs drivers to buy energy off-peak when cost is low. The city makes energy miners and energy traders of us all. 2.21 p.m. Downtown New York. Sensors throughout New York provide information essential to its running and to keep people safe. This city is aware. Real-time information flows into the city cockpit. All data is integrated and visualized, enabling the city to run more efficiently. Traffic lights and information systems are adapted to allow traffic to flow smoothly. Citizens have a direct connection to public services and can participate at every level. This is a city that responds to the needs of its population. 4 p.m. Copenhagen. Parks are the city's green lines. Millions of trees line walkways and cycleways. Copenhagen Harbour is clean enough for swimming. 4.07 p.m. New York. Building facades trap CO2 and produce methanol for use as fuel. Renewable energy, efficient buildings and clean transport create the cleanest air since the Industrial Revolution. In the harbour, the water is filtered by billions of native oyster. 5.36 p.m. London. Journeys across the city take people and packages from one mode of transport to another via mega hubs. When making plans to meet friends, your navigation assistant plans your route. The navigation assistant instantly reacts to outside events and changes your route. The journey is only two stops on the underground, and then it's just a short walk to the crystal. 1.07 a.m., the city at night. The city restocks, recharges, and recycles. Jobs that can be done overnight are automatically activated. Our future city never sleeps. Its cycle continues. So 
just a little taster of some things to come. Um, so just a final thought to leave you with and um, just a question really for you to think about what will the infrastructure of the future look like and uh, perhaps um, some of my own thoughts um, of what might be happening. I put it to you that perhaps in the future what we'll see is software as a service, computation as a utility and data as a resource. That's everything from me. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you.